Guns and the control thereof is, as we all know, a topic of no small controversy. They are also, though, at bottom line, a business. From American Public Media, this is Marketplace. In Los Angeles, I'm Kai Rizdal. It is the 5th of January. Today, Tuesday, good as always to have you along, everybody. The clip you are going to see of the president on the evening news tonight, or the clip you have been seeing on cable and social media all day already, is the one from his speech on gun control at the White House this morning, the one where he tears up talking about the children killed at Sandy Hook Elementary. The president offered a long list of those killed and wounded by gun violence in this country, and then he offered his latest plan to do something about it, his newest set of proposals, I guess you'd say. He started with this. Number one, anybody in the business of selling firearms must get a license and conduct background checks or be subject to criminal prosecutions. All right, so let me hit the relevant part of that thing one more time. Anybody in the business of selling firearms. What does that mean exactly? The business of selling firearms. Marketplace's Annie Baxter gets us going. Jens Ludwig, a gun policy researcher at the University of Chicago, says defining a gun dealer is tricky. Because the original Gun Control Act was written in an ambiguous way. That's the Gun Control Act of 1968. It requires that people who are in the business of selling a firearm get a license to do so, but not hobbyists, like someone who's selling her old rifle because she's going to get a new one. So you didn't want to make a hobbyist go through a bunch of paperwork just to sell one gun that they were going to get rid of. But since then, Ludwig says a gray area has emerged. It consists of people who may not have a storefront, but who regularly sell firearms at gun shows or online. Ludwig says many gun transactions in the U.S. involve people who are not licensed gun dealers. President Obama's executive action calls for greater scrutiny of dealers trying to pass as hobbyists. Their business cards might show their hand or the frequency of their sales. But law professor and gun control skeptic Eugene Volick says those factors the president is pointing to don't do much to clarify who dealers are. Those are factors that are already being considered by courts. That may be the case. But according to Cassandra Crafasi with the Center for Gun Policy and Research at Johns Hopkins University, gun sellers who flout the law are seldom prosecuted. It's far more likely that people will prosecute drug traffickers than gun traffickers that have violated laws. Crafasi says even a little more clarity on the definition of who is a gun dealer could help. The more gun dealers who are licensed, the more buyers who will get background checks. I'm Manny Baxter for Marketplace. The president wasn't the only politician making a speech today, not by a long shot, probably. But the one we're going to talk about next came from Bernie Sanders, senator from Vermont, presidential aspirant, as you know, also fierce critic of Wall Street's influence on the American economy. Sanders was in New York today laying out his plans to tackle income inequality too big to fail and how he wants to reinstate the Glass-Steagall Act, which he mentioned by name something like six separate times. Let us not forget, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed this bill into law precisely to prevent Wall Street speculators from causing another Great Depression. And it worked for more than five decades until Wall Street watered it down under President Reagan and killed it under President Clinton. Marketplace's Tracy Samuelson explains why a Depression-era banking regulation is still top of mind today. Okay, imagine some of that cliche, jazz agey music here. We're in the early 1930s, after the crash of 1929, and Congress says, hey, banks, new rule. You got to separate your commercial banking, investment banking, and insurance businesses. MIT's Simon Johnson. The idea then, and and there's some validity to this now as well, is that if you are mixing different kinds of activities, making it more complex, more opaque, uh, it's easier to make mistakes, it's easier to behave uh, badly, it's easier to become very big. Fast forward to the late 90s, Glass-Steagall is repealed amid a wave of deregulation, in part with the argument that it would help banks be more profitable, more globally competitive. But the idea that there should be some type of firewall between custodian bankers and more entrepreneurial, risky Wall Street types, oh, how it lingers. Lawrence Baxter is a professor at Duke Law School. The Glass-Steagall element that keeps coming back, I think it rests on a deep belief that you shouldn't mix these two types of cultures especially if one of them is backed up by essentially the taxpayer. 
But the debate over reinstating Glass-Steagall is often about whether it would have helped prevent the last crisis. Candidate Hillary Clinton says no. So does Mark Calabria with the Cato Institute. He says at fault were non-banks and financial institutions Glass-Steagall didn't cover. Plus... Almost all activities that banks engage in is risky. There's this artificial distinction uh, that something going on on Wall Street is incredibly risky where what commercial banks do is non-risky. That's just not true. But he says it's no poison pill either. I'm Tracy Samuelson for Marketplace. Calmer today than yesterday, I think you might say, at the corner of Wall Street and Broad. We'll have the details when we do the numbers. Two thousand fifteen was very, very good to the American dollar, up eleven percent against the euro, four percent on the British pound. Great news for Americans headed overseas, their dollars buy more. Too bad, so sad for foreign visitors coming here, though their currencies obviously buy less. It's also bad for the US tourism industry, where jobs and big money are on the line. Marketplace's Mark Garrison reports now from New York on how tourism is fighting back. Have your tickets out, please. Longtime New York tour guide Larry Love is on a double-decker tour bus, taking tickets for his next run through Times Square in downtown. Asked what his favorite part of the job is, he goes straight for the sale. No shame. When the people give me a lot of money in this bag right here, this is what I like the most. He shakes the tip bag that sits just inside the door of his bus run by Gray Line City Sightseeing New York. The sack is unmissable. When they walk in, they see it. And when they come down the stairs, they see it. Once everyone's on board, he's off and running. Coming up on the left. Love has a mic, but he's loud enough to be heard, even over the traffic and squeaky chairs on the bus. His tour is a salty mix of history, insider tips, and loads of wisecracks. Make sure if you're going to get the hot dogs from the guys in the street, make sure they're wearing the rubber gloves. You'll notice the rag that he wipes his workstation with. Looks like it hasn't been washed in about 15 years. So make sure they're wearing the rubber gloves on their hands and they prepare the hot dogs for you. He plays up the attitude and the tourists eat it up. Nearly all of them leave a few dollars in the bag as they hop off. The tour company says the unusually warm fall was great for business, but lately I've noticed the mix of passengers change a bit, with fewer riders from Europe and Asia. That's a worry because international visitors are bigger spenders than American travelers. A strong dollar can sway global travel decisions at two key points, where to go and how much to spend when you get there. So we're here in midtown Manhattan. On another day, I take a walk with someone who spends every day working on how to make sure those answers are New York and lots. Fred Dixon is CEO of NYC and Company, the city's official tourism marketer. Last year, visitors spent $41 billion here. He says they help hotel, restaurant, and attraction businesses, but also the employees who work there. They're going to be taking their tips and their wages home to the local community where they're going to buy groceries, they're going to get their hair cut, supporting jobs outside of tourism, and actually building families, prosperity across all five boroughs of New York City. Of 56.5 million visitors to New York last year, about one in five came from abroad. But they accounted for about half of direct spending. So travel pros watch exchange rates closely. It's very important. Um, We can actually track visitation almost proportionate to the strength of the dollar. A strong dollar whacks the tour industry in two phases. First, people who are already here tighten up. We're constantly trying to work out how much it is in pounds. Grant Mason is from Newcastle, England, here with family. Today, the price of four Broadway tickets is nearly 70 pounds higher than at exchange rates during their previous visit. That's equivalent to just over $100. We certainly haven't spent as much this time around as we did the last time we were in New York. We bought jeans and aftershave and perfume, and and this time around we've bought very little, a couple of candles and a few toys for the kids, but other than that, not a great deal. But at least he's here. That gets us to the second phase of the strong dollar's impact. Global travelers tend to book far ahead. The worry is some who are on the fence about America may now choose a place with a more favorable exchange rate. And as for getting more U.S. travelers, it's a new challenge because Europe is now cheaper and more attractive to them. Dixon and his team have to convince them to choose New York over London or Rome. 
Key weapons are new cultural attractions and fashion. I mean, New York as a shopping trip, New York as your once-a-year check-in, got to get my new wardrobe for the spring season, um, is, is a message that, that resonates really strongly, particularly in the South and in the Southwest. So arts and culture and retail will be two areas that we will focus on, um, particularly with the American market. It all comes down to making sure enough people visit to keep the dollars flowing to shops, museums, hotels, and into the brown paper bag where Larry Love collects his tips. In New York, I'm Mark Garrison for Marketplace. As Star Wars continues its run at the top of the box office league tables, there is Hollywood news today via Beijing. The Chinese real estate and entertainment conglomerate Dalian Wanda is reportedly set to buy a controlling stake in legendary entertainment, the financiers behind a bunch of movies you will have heard of. Marketplace's Adrian Hill is on the entertainment desk for us. Hey, Adrian. Hey, Kai. What do we know so far about this deal then? We don't have a ton of detail yet. Reuters broke the news that Dolly and Wanda is nearing a deal to buy a majority stake in Legendary. It values Legendary somewhere between 3 and $4 billion. And Legendary is a production company. It helps finance mm-hmm. movies, and it's had its hands in a whole lot of big blockbuster right. Hollywood right. productions. So Jurassic World, Godzilla, The Dark Knight, it's got Warcraft coming out this summer. These are exactly the kind of movies that the international market, especially the Chinese market, loves. Godzilla, really? Oh. Okay. Yeah, we'll figure that one out. Um, <laughs> Who doesn't other than, love that? Other than having a piece of Godzilla, what, what does Dalian Wanda want out of this thing? Well, by every indication, this is a company looking to be a global entertainment leader. Take a listen to this tape from the head of the company. Okay. Also one of China's richest men, Wang Ling. He was interviewed for a story we did with the BBC last year. We don't want to become another Disney. For one reason, Disney is too old. It already has an 80-year history. I don't want to be like that. I would like to create a brand new Wanda-style entertainment project. We have our own ambition. We might even have a larger scale. Disney, that's, I mean, they're they're going for, they're shooting right for the top. Oh, yeah. No small ambition here, Kai. They own hundreds of theaters in China. They bought AMC, the movie theater chain here in the U.S. back in 2012. Dolly and Wanda is working on an $8 billion film studio in China as we speak. It includes an underwater stage. (laughs) I know. And... They're hoping to build connections and inroads into Hollywood, and I think this makes sense for both sides. That's UC Santa Barbara film professor Michael Curtin. He says a partnership here could help Dali and Wanda and even the Chinese government that the head of Dali and Wanda is really close to. This is a learning experience for them about film financing and how to make successful international films. All right, so that's what Dali and gets. What about Legendary? They get a couple of billion dollars in what? Well, maybe access to this enormous Chinese market for movies. Yeah. The booming Chinese middle class is going to the theater in a way we're not necessarily here in the U.S. China's box office receipts grew 50 percent last wow. year to six point eight billion dollars. Hollywood films are were only a little bit more than a third of that. Here's Curtin again. Hmm. Hollywood's all in on China. They realize that it's going to be the biggest market in the world. They realize that a lot of their films, their big films, their franchise films, perform as well, if not better, in China. And it won't be long before that will be the primary market for those big franchise films. Right now in China, the government has a quota for how many Mm -hmm. foreign films Mm -hmm. can come in. They also set the release dates of these films. So it's possible this legendary deal could get legendary movies outside of the quota and get better release dates. For all these reasons, we're going to see more and more of these partnerships and relationships and deals happening as both China and Hollywood try to get what the other one has. Right. Last thing, and then I'll let you go. Is this going to change the kind of movies that that, uh, Legendary makes? Unlikely. So I asked Michael Curtin that question, and he told me, look, Legendary's already making the kind of movies that the Chinese government's really comfortable with. They're okay with these big blockbuster franchise movies. So we're unlikely to see a change there. Uh, Except maybe more Godzilla. More Godzilla. And don't we all want that guy? (laughs) Adrian Hill (laughs) covers the entertainment desk for us. Thanks. Thanks. Coming up. You know, people are talking about it, and that's the point of advertising, especially in fashion. Jaden Smith gets a new gig, but first, let's do the numbers. 
Dow Jones Industrial Average closed up nine points today, not even a tenth percent, closed at 17,158. The Nasdaq down 11 points, about a quarter percent, 4891. The S&P 500 up four points, two tenths percent, ended things at 2016. We talked about President Obama's gun control proposals earlier. Smith & Wesson up 11 percent today. Sturm Ruger added nearly 7 percent. Car makers are coming off a banner year, except... Scandal-plagued Volkswagen, that is, it shares down nearly 4% today after a report that Twitter would launch a messaging service that accommodates 10,000 characters, not just 140. The stock was down about 3% or so because, of course, you're listening to Marketplace. This is Marketplace. I'm Kai Rizdahl. Joseph Schumpeter is alive and well and has been spotted on the streets of New York this week. New York City is doing away with its payphones and replacing them with free Wi-Fi kiosks, 7,500 of them. From WNYC in New York, Jessica Gould reports. Here in New York City, the future is calling. This is going to be the fastest and largest uh, free municipal network in the world. Colin O'Donnell is the chief technology officer for CityBridge, which is partnering with the city to rip out old payphones and put in high-speed internet instead. They're called links, nine-and-a-half-foot slabs that look like fancy mall directories. But they're actually hubs for Wi-Fi that will reach about a block and a half. They will include built-in tablet computers and phone chargers. You can use them to call anywhere in the U.S. for free. The first is already installed on a corner in the East Village, though it hasn't been switched on yet. Sitting at a Starbucks a few feet away, grad student Aaliyah Gutman says she's a fan. It's interesting. I mean, it's going to be more useful than a payphone now. But she's not sure how much she'll use it. I'm not going to be sitting outside at a bus stop with my computer on the Wi-Fi, connecting to that and working there. To pay for it, the kiosks will have ads, big ones, right there on the sidewalk. O'Donnell says those ads will raise enough to cover the free stuff with money left over for the company and the city. And city officials say all the free Wi-Fi fits with their mission to give more poor people access to the Internet. But the new kiosks do have their critics. Some worry about private information flowing out over the public Wi-Fi. Others say they'll miss the old payphones. But officials say the network will be as safe as any public Wi-Fi. People can opt for encryption. And for the people who still love those Superman-style phone booths, three of them are staying put, even as the rest go up, up, and away. In New York City, I'm Jessica Gould for Marketplace. The United States Department of Agriculture issues, you might be interested to know, a monthly bison report. It's just like it sounds, a rundown of the current state of the bison crop, I guess you'd say, in this country. And let me just tell you, business is booming. Bison burgers, bison steaks, bison chili. Ranchers are getting nearly three times as much for their bison meat today as they were 10 years ago. Emily Guerin has that story. Pen number one, 24 year in bulls. Winter is bison auction season. And this one on the Cannonball Ranch in North Dakota is one of the Any biggest questions? in the country. I'll write down there who gave 2,000 for him. I'll bid 1,213. I'll bid $1,213. The auctioneer has a clean white cowboy hat and jeans. The bidders are wearing muck boots and dirty Carhartt jackets. They bid by catching the eye of the auctioneer's assistants, who run between them yelling out whenever bids are made. First ones of the day will be the cheapest all day. I got 18. Give me 1,900. He tries all kinds of mind tricks to raise the price. And then, suddenly, he calls it off. So, 1800 right here. Put on number 206. 206, $1,800 for a yearling bull. That's actually pretty expensive. Ten years ago, yearling bulls were selling for less than $800 at comparable auctions. I remember the day when you couldn't give a buffalo away. That's buyer James Thompson. He's talking about in the 90s, before bison meat was as in demand as it is right now. Thompson bought 275 bison today, or buffalo. People here use the words interchangeably. That's two semi-trucks and around half a million dollars worth. Luckily, we're spending somebody else's money. He's buying for another rancher. And on the selling side of the auction, Beverly Fisher and her husband. I'm very satisfied. She's a bit worn out, so she sits down on a trailer and lights a cigarette. Have a seat, my dear. Last year, she and her husband borrowed a bunch of money and bought 800 bison as an investment. It worked. I'm going to take what profit I've got out of this. I'm going to turn around and buy more buffalo. There's an easy explanation for why prices are so high. 
supply and demand. You know, we've got a whole other generation of young people growing up, and uh, they're a little more conscious about what they put into their body. Bison meat is leaner than beef, and federal regulations require it to be growth hormone and antibiotic free. Demand is booming. Ground bison meat is about twice as expensive as it was six years ago, and supply hasn't kept up. There just aren't enough bison ranchers. It takes somebody special to run these buffalo and build a handle them. Greg Riken is the fast-talking man with the big white cowboy hat. I asked him why more cattle ranchers don't switch to bison, especially given that cattle prices are down. One word, he said, fences. Fences around here are six and seven foot high and all pipe and instead of the barbed wire we use for the cattle. So they, they have some more additional expenses and costs of keeping these buffalo in and keeping them safe. The importance of good fences became very clear watching the guys load bison onto the trucks. The men had set up a long chute leading from a corral up a ramp and onto an idling semi-truck. There was one gate along the chute that was chained shut. And somehow, one of the bison managed to bust it open. The bison took off. For a minute, it looked like it would just keep going, running free across the prairie like its ancestors. But then, someone jumped on an ATV and chased it back into the corral, where it became livestock again. At the Cannonball Ranch in North Dakota, I'm Emily Guerin for Marketplace. The new face of Louis Vuitton's latest line of women's wear is a 17-year-old boy. Will Smith's son, Jaden, got the gig. We've got fashion journalist Kate Betts on the line to talk me through it. Hey, Kate. Hi, Kai. How are you? I'm good. Let me get your gut check on this one first, though. Uh, Valid marketing idea or completely gimmicky uh, trick? Well, I think it's, you know, people are talking about it, and that's the point of advertising, especially in fashion. But it's also tapping into a bigger cultural trend, and that's also something that happens in fashion. It's the whole, it's the gender androgyny and and all of that stuff that's kind of in the air out there today. It is in the air. I mean, if you look at a lot of celebrities, especially, they're all tapping into it. Um, Thinking of Kanye West wearing skirts, for Mm -hmm. example, Mm -hmm. and Laverne Cox and all of it. But let me also say this. The androgyny idea is not new, certainly not in fashion, But I think every new generation has its kind of influence on this idea. Well, right. So talk to me for a second about uh, about the generational thing, because Jaden Smith is a 17 year old kid. Clearly, they're trying to appeal, I I think. I don't know. I'm going to ask you. You're the expert uh, to, to the younger generation. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think the millennials, as they call them, is the is the sweet spot for advertising now. And certainly in fashion, that's who people are trying to appeal to. You know, I think it's something that we've seen on runways for a few seasons now, designers like Hedy Slimane at YSL or Prada, Gucci, they've all been experimenting with this idea of androgyny or even gender fluidity right. on the runway. Uh, Louis Vuitton and, and the others you mentioned, YSL, Yves Saint Laurent and those, I mean, they are old style, old line fashion companies. Are they now seeing the light here and, and saying we got to get on this? Well, no. I mean, I think they are old fashion brands, but they are very much in the contemporary market right. now. So I think that's the more interesting thing that's happening is that they're really going for the contemporary vibe, whereas probably they used to appeal to an older customer. Not older, but, you know, a woman in her right. 30s, maybe, or 40s. But the shift is is interesting that it's happening so abruptly toward millennials in advertising. So besides millennials, though, who do you think they're targeting with this ad? Or is it just let's get the buzz out there and, and, and hope we get some hangers on? Well, I think it's let's get the buzz out there. I think that there is definitely the kind of people are talking about uh, trend in advertising here. But I also think that they're tapping into the celebrity culture, Mm -hmm. the idea of the offspring of celebrity, which is also a big topic on runways and in the fashion world. So so they're hitting a lot of really strong notes with this. And and also the idea of credibility, right? Because Jaden Smith, I mean, he wore a a dress to his prom. He's been known for for sort of cutting-edge fashion kind of stuff. 
Yeah, and he's become kind of a personality in that whole realm that people are watching and people right. are waiting for his next move. So, so it all kind of syncs up together nicely here. Marketing at its best. Kate Betts, her most recent book is called My Paris Dream. It's a memoir. You can look it up actually on our website because we talked about it. Kate, thanks a bunch. Thank you, Kai. This final note on the way out today in which I am going to read you some wire copy. You are going to draw your own conclusions, all right? Reuters, 1045 this morning, Los Angeles time. Here is the entire item. Quote, United, Delta, JetBlue, each separately raised one-way airfares by $3, attributed to company spokesmen, like they all three came up with the idea all by their lonesomes, right? It is worth mentioning here and entirely relevant that the Justice Department is looking into whether airlines are working together to illegally keep fares high. We report, you decide. All right, we got to go. The Dow up nine points today. That is not even a tenth of one percent. The Nasdaq declined 11 points, a quarter percent. The S&P 500 up four points, two tenths of one percent. Caitlin Esch is the producer on our Wealth and Poverty Desk. Our digital producer is Tony Wagner. The senior digital producer around here is Nishat Kurwa. I'm Kai Rizdal. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. This is APM.